Hello, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, Scaling Up Floating Solar, Lessons from Asia. Well, uh, welcome. And my name is Manuela Hartung. I'm project manager here at Solar Plaza. And I'll be joined today by Tia King from SunGrow Floating. And she will be talking to us a little bit about yeah, the floating solar market and some uh, exciting projects happening in Asia. And of course, what we can learn from them. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, just some uh, some practical notes. Sorry, we are just uh, passing on the slides. <laughs> so just for today, I will give a short introduction on uh, Solar Plaza and uh, on the topic. And we will have a presentation from Tia, as I just said. And we will end this webinar with a Q&A session. So you can uh, uh, ask some questions to Tia. And of course, we'll end the webinar uh, a bit later. Um, yes, so uh, just a little bit about Solar Plaza for those who don't know us yet. Well, our mission is to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. We are a global events organizer and we are established uh, since 2004. We are based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and we have done over 150 events uh, worldwide. So we also uh, share knowledge not only through our events, but also through our uh, resources that we publish very often. Um, so also uh, during the, the past times, during the, the COVID crisis, we also expanded our business a little bit. So we also launched uh, three different business uh, branches. And one of them is the Solar Plaza Consultancy, where we offer um, yeah, solutions for new market entrants. Uh, and also we share, uh, yeah, we also have the Solar Plaza Academy, which is more dedicated to, to training in the solar space. And we also have the Solar Plaza Foundation, which we launched in order to accelerate the sustainable energy transition for everyone. So uh, also beyond our business to business activities. So this is a little bit about us. And I wanted to share with you also some practical notes. Uh, just in case you have questions, uh, technical questions, you can use the chat box that you see on your screen. And that, that chat box is also for questions that you have for Tia. So I encourage you to during the presentation already send your questions and then Tia will address them at the end. So please feel free to already uh, yeah, send these questions uh, throughout the presentation. And of course, as always, our presentation slides and the full recordings will be available for you after Afterwards, you should receive an email with instructions uh, in about two days. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about the, the practical notes. And now I would like to, yeah, to welcome Tia to join us. So Tia, if you're there, you can already, um, yeah, you can already show up on the screen. So just a little bit about Tia. She is the overseas business development manager at uh, SunGrow Floating. She is working already for over seven years uh, at uh, SunGrow. And since the beginning of 2020, she is already uh, dedicated to floating solar. So to expanding the portfolio of floating PV projects at SunGrow Floating. And of course has a very vast experience in accounting, strategic marketing, and in business development. So Tia, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Manila. Thank you for the introduction. Thank, Thank you, you, Tia. So without further ado, please uh, take it away and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Manuela. Okay. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I will going to just give the short presentation regarding our experience in uh, floating solar in Asia. So actually, um, it's a pity that it cannot be in person at floating solar conference Amsterdam due to the restriction of the COVID-19. Thanks for Solar Plaza's organization for the webinar. Um, as of for uh, floating solar, it has been a hot topic during current years. It is a niche market, but carries a huge potential. Today, I would like to share some of our experience from the projects we've achieved in Asia, from what we did to what we learned. So here, the agenda will be divided, uh, divided into three parts. Uh, 
As for Sangru FPV, uh, we are a wholly subsidiary from Sangru Group. Most people know Sangru by our inverter, but indeed our floating business is proceeding quite well in the market. Sangru FPV was established at the end of 2016. During five years de development, we've achieved a total 1.4 gigawatt floating solar supply with more than 115 projects in the globe. Besides the self-owned factories with annual production near one gigawatt, we also resources uh, local factories, especially uh, to help solving the high freight cost. So far, we have factories uh, in Indonesia, Thailand, and Europe. Meanwhile, our abundant experience on project designing, we also tailor the solution according to different tilts, snow load, and water type. From technical background, we've obtained over 100 patents and 15 TUV certificates to prove the design lifetime of 25 years. So far, we are engaged with CPIA, which is the Chinese PV Association, to formulate the anchoring standard. At the meantime, we've verified by DNV regarding on the anchoring calculation methodology. More importantly, all this above make our products bankable. So when we're looking back, even with the effect of COVID-19, Sangru FPV has realized a small booming in the past 2020 and the last three quarters in 2021. With the start of the first largest FPV in Malaysia and Thailand, we placed our flags in more areas. Most of projects were in Southeast Asia, while it can be found that the application is more and more diversified. It may also indicate floating solar can hold many opportunities. When talking about the opportunity, there must be challenge with it. The first challenge I would like to mention is about frozen. I think most of North areas will have to face this issue, no matter in China or in Europe. We have test bed in northern China to study the anti-frozen. We are concerning about the operation condition of the floating product and system under the extreme cold area, the performance of the adaptability and the systematic safety. The study has approved our floating structure can survive with a minus 40 degree. Since 2020, more and more developers have set their sights on the offshore areas. Part of them have begun to occupy some offshore area with superior environmental conditions. The solution for offshore puts forward higher requirements on floating products, mental parts, and system safety. Among them, the wave breaker program and its related products have received special attention. The function is to weaken the waves in the FPV area. As shown on the right side of the above figure, after the wave passes through the wave breaker, the wave height and the wave length are being apparently weakened. The overall effect is the water, stay, is the water will be stay more calm after passing the wave breaker. So when we looking outside of uh, when we looking outside of China, there are a lot of projects emerge in Asia. The first project I would like to mention is about Singapore Tank Reservoir 60 megawatt FPV project. Um, the project has compared to uh, Crown Jewel in the owner's portfolio. Before the project, the world's largest floating solar PV test bed with 10 floating PV system called a first of its kind was launched in 2016. A study shows the floating solar will bring 5% to 15% higher power generation than the rooftop. Also with other positive study results, then the 16 megawatt project on Tanga Reservoir can be raised. As the reservoir is a drinking water, the process of the environmental study is very strict. From the slide, we proved the environmental friendly from these three aspects, which are floating material, floating product, and floating system. The GB standard is a safety testing standard for drinking water distribution equipment, which to prove that the floating material is food grade. The ROS test, many proves that the floating material, uh, material itself does not contain toxic or the hazardous substance. The BS6920, many proves that the floating material has no impact on the water when immersed in the water and there is no inclusion. 
At the same time, we also did a systematic environmental inspection, on-site water quality sampling, and inspection of the FPV station after four years of operation. The EU surface water standards providing that the floating system has no effect on the water body. The environmental protection of the floating materia is the starting point of our material, uh, material research and development, and it is a rigid index, which is an unchanging principle. At the same time, we also put most of our energy on the research of the weather resistance of floating materials. FPV stations have to operate safely on the water for 25 years or even longer, which requires our floating products to have the characteristics of long-term life, anti-fragile and anti-aging. Each batch of incoming materials and the floating products will be randomly inspected. If there are quality problems with the floating products sent to the site, they are all traceable. When we look into the uh, social response of the tank reservoir project, uh, the 16 megawatt FPV serves to power all five local water treatment plants on mainland. These water treatment plants produce portable water for Singapore. With the powering of the water treatment plants, Singapore is one of the few countries with a 100% green water uh, work system. The 16 megawatt FPV will reduce carbon emission by about 32 kilotons annually, or the equivalent of 7,000 fewer cars on the roads. The Prime Minister, uh, Minister Li Xianlong, cares about the project as well. He visited the site and posted thinking to say that is a significant step towards a greener and more sustainable future for Singapore. The second project I would like to refer uh, is in Thailand. The Electric Generating Authority of Thailand, which is known as IGAT, has announced its plan to build 2.7 gigawatt FPV till 2000, 2037. Cyrodon Dam, 58.5 megawatt FPV project, it is the start. The goal is to maximize the use of existing resources, which is a combination between FPV and the hydroelectric power. The water depth is 27 meters and the water level variation is 7 meters. To deal with it, we designed the 8 megawatt single floating array with the gravity anchoring method, while to leave the enough anchoring radius which to control the drift between two floating arrays. Also due to the water level variation with the wind speed of 42 meters per second, the system must perform the well regarding wind resistance, even to consider about a typhoon level. Around March 2021, a storm arrived at the project, which has already installed two islands. It is not affected here at all. During the construction of this project in Thailand, we provided a complete solution for the floating system of the photovoltaic area, including early design consulting service, later floating system design, anchoring, de uh, anchoring system design, and other design service. In the process of project construction, uh, we have applied our experience advantage to help customers solving various problems. For instance, laying on the site, guiding assembling process, um, specify operation, arranging labor and workload, designing anchoring block, building construction platform, and etc., which all support to speed up the construction efficiency. The project has used uh, available resources into the maximum benefit. Due to the surface area, uh, area of Ceridum Dam and the high voltage power station, the efficiency has not been fully used. But when combined floating with hydro and with the energy management system called EMS, which is uh, developed by IGET, the cost of electricity produced in each unit will be lower. Meanwhile, it can reduce greenhouse gas emissions approximately 0.5 tons per megawatt. From the Ceridon project, we can found that the utilization of the single energy type may be constrained by many parties. In the future development process, the construction of a comprehensive energy system with the integration of multiple energy sources is becoming a general trend. An important breakthrough uh, in a carbon safe and efficient energy system. As shown above, FPV can form a multi energy complementary approach with hydrogen production, energy storage, and offshore wind power.
The third project I would like to address uh, was located in Malaysia. Malaysia Selangor 13 megawatt FPV project has come up under LSS round two, the country's competitive large scale solar LSS program through which the Energy Commission. The project levelized the cost of energy while total investment in the facility was around 11.3 million. This 30 megawatt project is a special application due to its exit water. The FPV field is a mining lake where sand is mined with a, uh, with a pH index around 3. This, this makes the, the utilization of the overall material of the floating system different from the conventional freshwater solution. For example, the morning rope used in the project is a polymer rope, while the conventional freshwater ro uh, rope is stainless steel wire rope. Therefore, it is necessary to design the solutions in a target manner after confirming the input parameters. Basing on the FPV stations we have done so far, compared to uh, conventional freshwater solutions, some special application scenarios have appeared as listed. At extremely cold area, we need to deal with issues such as freezing, ice flow collusion, etc. In industrial waters, we need to encounter with circulating water, cooling water, treated water, and etc. As well as some mine lakes formed by various mines, specific water samples need to be tested to determine the application of system materials. At offshore areas, we need to conquer marine salty corrosion, high waves, high wind speed, etc. It requires special treatment methods. The both application scenarios in special water put forward more and uh, put forward more and higher requirements for the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of FPV stations. For Sangro FPV, we have a professional structure research and development team, a material study team, a test analysis team, an anchor design team, and a system solution team to solve the problems in accordance with each application scenarios. For application scenarios such as freezing, special water bodies, and offshore, we have corresponding solutions and project cases which can be taken as a reference. However, there are many problems still restricting us. For example, more economic wave breaker equipment is the urgency of the development. At present, the cost of, per, per, the, cost of the projects with uh, equipped uh, wave breaker to pass the eco, uh, economic evaluation. Under the precondition of ensuring the effect of the wave breaker, we are studying and developing a more economic wave breaker solution. So for uh, Sangro FPV, we believe where is the water, where is the potential. The map here shows the locations of lakes and reservoirs in the range of the water wild. For now, Asia is leading the market where most of them are beneficial from the sportive policy. But we also can clearly find the water resources in EU and US is sufficient. With the more and more mature technique, technology of floating solar, EU and US will wake, wake soon and speed up the development. FPV, uh, hope FPV will grow from the niche market to the mainstream. When we dip down into regions, we think Southeast Asia will still lead the running for a while, not only due to its abundant water resources, but also related to the plan for the floating solar. Besides Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia, uh, which I have mentioned before, it is already quite clear that Laos have 200 megawatt in pipeline, while Indonesia is preparing for the capacity of 2.2 gigawatt. When referring to Europe, Netherlands is speeding up its progress, while Portugal announced its 500 megawatt plan for floating solar. Things are getting hard from zero to one. Let's get up from one to 10. For Sangro FPV, we will always stand by here for the, uh, for the spot and just let me know if you have any questions. Let's back to Meloila. Okay. 
Hi, Tia. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, a lot of a lot of great insights, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of lessons that uh, other countries can learn. I was just curious. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. So, mm -hmm. if you could uh, if you could give the audience the main takeaway, let's say for for offshore projects, what would be for for Sun Grove floating the main lesson that people need to take into account when developing offshore floating? I think for the offshore floating project, there are two main challenges. Uh, the one challenge is about the condition regarding on the high wave height. Usually the offshore will have the wave height over one meters and the high wind speed. So that's what I mentioned, uh, the wave breaker we are studying so far. But so we already have these kinds of project uh, of this kind of product, but so far we are optimizing it to make it more economic. And another thing is about the anti-corrosion because the environment is very very salty. So uh, regarding on the anti-corrosion, we also did the test uh, to test the whether the, the materials can be live for uh, maybe 25 years in the corrosion time. And for sure, so far we have some like offshore projects. And I think I, I have uh, we have shared these kinds of uh, case study at the previous webinar uh, of the solar plaza. Perfect, Tia. Yeah. And I think you, uh, well, you got uh, some questions from the audience as well. There's uh, quite some questions that came in. So yeah. I wanted to, yeah, to ask you to, to address some of these questions. Uh, okay. I think the, I, I'm sure you can see the, the box of, uh, of questions. So I think the first question is, a, is an interesting one. Um, mm -hmm. And that question was asked by Stanislas Merle, and he was wondering about the details on, on anti-frozen solution. I was also very curious about that, and I think a lot of people are. So uh, what, what is exactly the, the anti-frozen solution and how, and how the, can it cope with more, let's say, big loads of snow? Mm, okay, actually, the snow load is one concern. Uh, another concern is about the frozen. Uh, the, uh, many of our clients are asking whether the frozen condition will influence the structure of the floating uh, floating itself or the floating product. So for the pr floating product, we have uh, uh, we have make a test poll to uh, test uh, the, the how many low temp temperature it can resist so far and also it's uh, authorized by TUV uh, about the minus 40 degree we can resist uh, what I mean is for zero and also for the structure we also got the test report to improve uh, to, uh, to prove uh, that our structure can be survived under the frozen test and will no, no influence on the strength of the whole structure. Oh very good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's it's a solution that will be very useful for many countries, right? Especially <laughs> so, for some countries with snow. Exactly. So I think a lot of countries can can definitely take that as a as a good uh, as a good solution, and hopefully yeah. also this helps your path helps other uh, yeah other companies and other stakeholders to also develop this kind of technology, also based yeah. on your contributions. Okay. Uh, and okay. now I wanted to ask you another question from another uh, participant, uh, which mm -hmm. was regarding the the wave breaker, uh, because mm -hmm. this is also uh, yeah it raises a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, he is asking us. Uh, how how can the wave breaker can uh, can make the waver the way the water calmer the waves calmer is that actually mm -hmm. possible Mm, yes, it's possible. Actually, in my presentation slide, uh, we have an animation that we test in practical to see what how the wave breaker will be influence the wave. Actually, but it's a pity that we cannot share on the presentation because it's an animation. So we can find that actually the wave will become more calm after pass the wave uh, wave breaker and it will be more safety regarding on the whole floating system. Maybe I think uh, I can just sharing the video to the email if just leave the email to me. Perfect. I think we can, uh, yeah, we can share this, uh, this video also together with the presentation to all the participants, right? Mm -hmm. yes. I think will be very useful. And mm -hmm. regarding the, the anchoring system, Tia, uh, there's also a lot of questions uh, regarding that. Uh, well, you guys recently got uh, a verified by DNV, right, with the, the anchoring mooring system. So that yeah. is also a big step for, for the industry in, as a whole. And But there are some questions regarding the, the auto-adjusting functions of the, of the anchoring systems. Can, mm -hmm. the, can the, the anchoring systems adjust to water level variations? This is also a question we got from the audience. 
Yes, uh, the water level, uh, what do you mean is that the can, can adjust the water level variation by the anchoring? Yes, exactly. Okay, uh, based on our experience uh, as at what I mentioned in the Thailand project, the water level variation is seven meters. So uh, regarding on the water level variation, it's usually uh, more related to the morning ropes length of it. Usually we will leave the uh, enough morning ropes and to leave the anchoring radius and to control the drift between two floating areas in accordance with the situation. Okay, very well. Mm -hmm. Um, another question also we got uh, is uh, regarding still the, the snow loads. Uh, there's a few questions still coming in about that. So uh, a question for you is if you experience floats being submerged due, due to, the, to the snow loads, was that something that you guys experienced in your projects? You mean the, just like the floating just totally be buried in the snow load? In the yeah, I, I think I think this could be one scenario, right? Or maybe some of the floats being submerged, but not all of them. But was that something that uh, that happened? Mm, as far as I know, so far our, uh, our project or pilot project or testing project has not been buried under the snow. But uh, <laughs> actually, I can I can check whether it will be uh, uh, one part of our our testing or not. So maybe for these questions, I, I just can uh, reply later. Okay, perfect. Uh, another interesting question we got, Tia, is regarding the, the frameworks for floating PV. So uh, are they recyclable? Is that something that you are also uh, considering in your project? And what would be, for example, the impact of this to the, to the marine life under the platforms? Mm -hmm. Yes, for the for the recycle or recyclable is absolutely the trend that we will st study for. But so far, we uh we as long as I mentioned all the all the material is uh, food grade, and I think uh, the recycle the, the recyclable must be one of our targets. Okay, very good. That's good to know. Um, and then I have another question for you. Um, uh, well, it's regarding basically the, let's say, the, the life cycle of, of the components. I think this is also a very, very recurrent question. So uh, you, uh, you mentioned very often also in, in the website of the company that the, the components and the plant is designed to last around 25 years. So is this also the expected lifetime for, for example, for the anchoring and mooring systems, or that's only for, for the, the, the surface of the plant? Uh, absolutely for the whole system, including Anchor. Okay, very good. And and how? And if you could also share like some of the, let's say, the main takeaways for the for the life cycle of a plant, because I think this is a big concern for uh, for floating solar in general. Uh, mm -hmm. What would be the main lessons that you can share for uh, people developing projects? Uh, yeah, in in for example, in uh, salt water or lakes. This uh, yeah, the corrosion is always a, a concern, but also the hard conditions. So what would be for 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 the the audience and for also everybody? interested in, uh, in developing floating projects, the main lessons to actually protect the, the plant and to ensure a very good uh, lifetime cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you mean how to ensure the lifetime cycle? Exactly, a long lifetime cycle, right? So what would be for, for you the, the main takeaways for, for people developing floating solar? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, anyway, as our uh, target and life uh, lifetime for the whole system is uh, 25 years. So no matter in the uh, fresh water or in the lake or in the offshore area, we must do to tailor all of our uh, solutions and the materials to satisfy all the requirements regarding to the project site condition. Uh, and all of our tests are, are, are under the requirement of the 25 years life design uh, design lifetime. So uh, I think think at least the, the, the test is passed. I think it's a very good approval to demonstrate that the, the system can survive under different kinds of solutions. Okay, perfect. Um, now, Atia, there is also a lot of questions. Uh, I think this could be uh, maybe uh, our, our last question to close it up. We have uh, plenty of questions from the audience, but well, a lot of the technical questions we also uh, we will gather them, and uh, Tia and her colleagues from the more technical part of Sun Grow Floating they can answer these questions afterwards. So just for everybody to know, the questions will be answered. We will make a list and make sure that they are all answered. But just to to close it up on a on a more, um, let's say, global note. A lot of people are interested to know as well, 
what is the potential for uh, outside of Asia, of course, also for Europe. You shared a little bit at the end that there is already uh, big plans for uh, certain countries in Europe. So how do you how do you plan on also expanding that? And also, what would be uh, what would be your outlook for for Europe, for example? Is uh, is uh, are some of these tests you have been doing and some of the applications you have been doing are they really replicable to Europe as well, or do you think we we'll have to start from scratch when you when you start doing projects over here? Mm, I think maybe uh, one thing uh, things are quite differentiated from Asia and Europe. One thing is that the policy may be quite different and the project size is quite different. For example, the Asia usually have a very quickly speed to scaling up the big capacity of the floating solar. But for European, I think many of our clients have more concerns regarding on the possibility of the floating solar. So maybe I, I think maybe if, if there's any concern, maybe we can start from a piloting project to on, on the the lake or on the maybe water area that the client choose to let more people know what is it and how it operates to have a more clear ver vision of the floating solar and for some group we don't have the minimized capacity regarding on the floating solar so actually as long as there is a demand we will like fully share our experience and give the fully support on the FPV project in Europe actually Europe mm, I think uh, it's a huge potential market well, wow, very good to know. Uh, also, uh, just another question that we also got from the audience that you mentioned about Europe that, well, there are current or currently already some manufacturing facilities in Europe that you can also use in applications for floating PV. Um, do, could you could you share some more details on uh, which countries and, and which uh, capacities are there? So also potentials maybe because you mentioned a few countries, but also are there more expected for other countries in Europe? Uh, I think maybe for the location of the uh, factory in Europe is quite sensitive. Uh, I think uh, it just uh, I will uh, reply privately, but not here. <laughs> but thanks for understanding. <laughs> Of course, Tia. Well, perfect. I think we yeah we covered uh, quite a lot of the, the questions that we had from the audience, but we still have quite a, quite a few, uh, but quite technical questions as well. So as I mentioned, uh, yeah, we will gather those questions and uh, Tia and her colleagues more dedicated to the technical part of uh, floating PV will uh, address them on uh, on the email together with all the the presentation as well and the video that you also share, right, Tia? Yes, of course. Perfect. Well, I would like to, to thank everyone for being here today with us. And I would like to thank Tia for sharing this very insightful presentation and for answering all these uh, nice questions that we got from the audience. Tia, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for thank you all for being with us today. And uh, well, if you are um, in Europe, maybe have a nice day. And if you are uh, all over the world, just uh, yeah, we see each other uh, in another moment, another webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.